Welcome to the Leonomics Show. Today we have with us Carl Mehta, the CEO and founder of Atlas. Carl, it's been an absolute pleasure to have you here in Malaysia and have you with us. Tell us a bit about yourself. I mean, you, you know, Atlas is an interesting proposition and we'll go to Atlas in a bit, but tell us about your background. How did you get to become the CEO of one of the fastest growing organizations on earth? Well, thank you for uh, having me here. So it's great to be here in uh, Malaysia. So my uh, story, uh, just in a quick, uh, short uh, summary, is that uh, I, I went to the United States uh, about 25 years back. Okay. To study? Uh, to study. And uh, ended up founding uh, four companies. So this is my fourth company in Silicon Valley wow. uh, okay. in the past 24 years. And uh, been driven mainly by trying to create uh, some great innovations based on all the problems that I personally come across. And being an engineer, I, I like building stuff. Uh, and I've built stuff in um, and, and products in different different uh, industries, from semiconductor to telematics to most. The recent one was in electronic uh, payment and and wallet technology, and then this most recent one is in knowledge and uh, and and learning, continuous learning. So the the journey is is all about um, you know seeing or feeling a problem. Sure. Uh, and then having uh, you know that tremendous uh, drive, that intense drive to now solve the problem, uh, finding the right uh, set of solution. Uh, you know, in Silicon Valley, it's much more easier to do than uh, probably in the other parts of the world because there is a very good uh, uh, startup ecosystem. Yep. So I've been very fortunate uh, and been a beneficiary of. Uh, uh, a lot of great entrepreneurs that I learned from. So I have a lot of good mentors. Mm. Uh, having good mentors is very important in life. And, and how did you land up there in the Silicon Valley? Was it you were studying at, at Silicon Valley itself? Yeah, so I, 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 had, um, I first went to Southern California okay. for studying and okay. then I uh, went the dot com and uh, I moved up to, to, to the valley to start my second company. Okay. Uh, because Silicon Valley has a lot of great uh, startup ecosystem. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So your second company, your first company was started in... Uh, in Southern California. In Southern California In also. LA, yeah. And, and then you sold it off or...? You, you yeah, so that, that company was taken over by another company which ah, was okay. in a larger semiconductor design sure. space. Sure. Yeah, um, and then the second company was in a telematic space called Mobile Area that was also acquired by Wireless Matrix. Wow. Uh, third company, PlaySpan, was acquired by Visa. Uh, and what you see today, the Visa Checkout, which is a TV commercial, yeah. it's a my technology that I built, uh, helped them transform from a 50-year-old plastic card company into a multi-channel wallet. Fantastic. Uh, and then the, the most recent is that cash. And, and, and I mean, where do you get, you know, we, we always say ideas, there are a million ideas, right? Yes. But where, how, how do you connect, I mean, the fact that is, do you, how do you find these ideas? I mean, they just come about and then you right. execute them or right. what, what's your process? Well, we all we all get a lot of ideas, um, you know, especially in the in the in the shower, uh, <laughs> you know, the best time, the best time when you are getting, um, you know, a lot of good good ideas. But I think, uh, uh, yeah, ideas are one percent, and you know, execution is ninety nine percent. The key thing is how do you curate those ideas and filter them, and and the whole validation process. So that is a way to you know validate, uh, take an idea, think about uh, you know, uh, do the market research. Uh, do the technical validation of the solution, um, get the market validation from you know potential customers or partners, uh, go to your mentors and ask them about it. So having that very open mindset is very critical. Uh, I think people do get caught into uh, very much trying to guard and being secretive over their ideas. And I think that is uh, really uh, one of the biggest mistakes that people do. Um, there's nothing like anyone can, you know, nobody can steal your ideas yeah. because even if people try to steal, it doesn't matter because what really matters is execution. Um, so I think um, whenever you have ideas, A, don't uh, kill uh, that idea and, and curiosity. Um, it does take a lot of effort to convert ideas into an execution, uh, an extraordinary amount of will and skill. Uh, and perseverance. So I think those are the three key things. Uh, and those are not easy. None of those are easy. I think the, the probably the skill is something that you can acquire um, with, 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 with effort put in, but the willpower uh, to stay on the course and believe in yourself uh, is very hard. Sure. Uh, 99% of the time, you know, when you have some new idea, uh, People are going to shut down your ideas by when you talk to them, they're going to tell you that it's not a good idea. 
or it's being done a hundred times. Uh, but I think still, you know, adapting that idea to something that is still very unique and that can solve a unique problem. And then once you believe in it, uh, keeping that belief uh, continuously going uh, and going through the failures, because obviously, you know, taking an idea to an execution is going to go through thousands and thousands of failures. Uh, so keeping that perseverance, sure. it becomes critical. And, you know, you've built three businesses, sold it off, and now you're building a fourth one. Yeah. You know, as you build these businesses, right, um, what's going in your mind? I mean, how, I'm sure there were challenges. I'm sure there were points where you wanted to give up. Yep. How, what, what keeps you going and how, how do, you, do you, you have a firm idea that this is going to be the exit point and yep. I'm going to take it to sell it? Or, or Well, what, what no, I, I, I never build for, for selling or exiting. That should never be the goal. Okay. In fact, it's the other way around. Uh, I never want to sell it. I want to build something that is very, very long term and that can become an institution uh, for hundreds of years or thousands of years. Um, but, you know, I mean, in the most previous business, in the payment business, we felt that Visa is such a great brand worldwide uh, that, you know, our idea and what we had built would go actually much more further and if faster partner, if, partner if we them. partner with them and our customers will be well served because they have a global capability. So sometimes it makes a lot more sense to for a smaller organization to become a part of a bigger organization because you get a lot more resources and you can serve your customers and your employees better. Uh, but otherwise, it's, it's never a plan to, to do an exit because you never build something which is built to last. Or, or permanent because you want to build something very, very permanent. Uh, but over the time, you may get those opportunities. And if it is in the best interest of your customers and your employees, then you do it. Mm -hmm. and, and what grounds you? I mean, not many people are successfully being able to build three great enterprises and sell it off. And now another great one in the making with, with yeah. the cars. Um, what sort of, what's, what's some secrets, I mean, uh, you know, that you think, uh, you know, has contributed to the success of your first three entities and now to your, th to your fourth one? Um, I think it all starts with the team um, because no matter what the idea is, the idea is going to keep changing over time because you'll have to adapt the idea to what the market requirement is. You'll have to adapt the idea to some of the technological constraints. Uh, but what is permanent or, or critical is the team. So if your starting team is a very solid team, you can see a company called Slack that has become yeah. so successful. Uh, they started in a gaming business. And when the games were not successful, they somehow figured out to build up messaging software, right? So what it tells you is that it's not about the idea, it's not about the market, it's really about the team because that set of people were so smart and, and more than smart, they were so driven that even when the failure comes in, uh, they are willing to work with each other rather than just quit. Uh, you know, the general uh, behavior is that sometimes when the first uh, uh, failure comes in, people panic and they start looking for another job. Uh, you know, and that's where the character comes out of people. Uh, you know, the, the, the best and the smartest people uh, at each point of failure, they don't panic. They actually, if they like each other, they believe in each other, they come even more closer together and say, okay, what else can we do? What can we do different? So I think the, the team is the most important aspect. Uh, the second thing is that having a, a shared sense of destination, which is saying that, you know, uh, we want to build something extraordinary and not like very specific, but something at a general level. So you don't need to know that I want to climb that particular hill, but you need to know a general sense of the mountains. And you say, well, I want to go in this direction. So whether it is messaging or enterprise software, then it's enterprise software. Uh, so in our case, let's say now it is, when I started EdCast, it was more about bringing a personalized experience to various knowledge and learning. It was very high level, extremely broad, right? Nothing very specific because we said, you know what, uh, we're going to figure out the, the specifics as we go. You have to have that belief and that, that willingness to learn and to You'll adapt and to iterate. But if you start very, very narrow, and then if that particular idea doesn't work, then you're going to get disappointed. And then, you know, one disappointment after another, depending on how much perseverance you have, you, you fall apart. Sure. But if you start with a much more broader canvas, then you tune in, you know, specifically where the gaps are in the market or where the opportunities are. Okay. We're going to take a quick break. We'll be right back with Carl Mehta, the founder and CEO of Adcast. <music> Okay. 
Welcome back to the Leader Make Show. We, we are with Carl Meta from Edcast. And, you know, Edcast is your latest and greatest, uh, you know, contribution back uh, with, with learning technology. Talk us through Edcast a little bit. You know, why Edcast? Um, what's so amazing about it? What, what, what's the disruption that you are seeking in this learning, uh, learning space? Sure. Well, so before starting Edcast, I was a venture capitalist. I was a partner at Menlo Ventures. And my typical day as a knowledge worker was uh, I would meet uh, three entrepreneurs, uh, you know, in a day, morning, afternoon, evening. Somebody's pitching me uh, a new business in robotics or new technology in genomics or, uh, you know, mm-hmm. big data. And making a decision on each one of those meetings, like a 5 to $10 million decision, Series A, Series B funding. And uh, I had to learn a lot about each one of this technology on a daily basis, even though I have an engineering background and I've worked in technology for 24 or 25 years. So I started blocking my calendar three times a day for learning about each one of these meetings. So I realized that uh, I need to be a continuous learner on a daily basis. Uh, And my form of learning was actually far more informal, what I would call, as opposed to taking the traditional classroom or a formal course. Uh, I would just learn from people whom I know. I would learn from reading just articles, videos from hundreds of different sites. And at some point, you know, that daily routine became very unwieldy because it's just difficult to go to 50 different places uh, to go and find the content, even though there's Google search, but it's too difficult. So I realized that to solve this pain point that I had, I had to build a software which is in this day and age, you have AI and machine learning available. So why not use AI to really understand who I am and what I'm interested in, like maybe robotics, maybe genomics. And the software will do all the hard work, the heavy lift the curation. of going and finding the yeah. right content from not just 50 or 100 places that I used to go manually, but could go to even 50,000 different sources because there are lots of great sources and then curate that content and bring me just three to five pieces of content that I can digest on a you know, short time that I have or all of us have on a daily basis. So that was a founding idea about Edcast. And uh, for the lack of better uh, metaphor, we said that, hey, this is something like a Netflix of knowledge and learning, just like Netflix is aggregating content from various studios yep. and then recommending you if you're really watching a lot more comedy movies. Uh, so, so that's basically the idea of Edcast. Okay, and, and so, so you started that out. How did you take it to the next level? I mean, you started to get funding. You, I mean, you probably knew the system pretty well. Um, but to grow at the pace, you know, what were some of the challenges and what was some of this thinking that was going on in your head in terms of building this business, building it fast and rolling it out in, in such speed that, has, that you've done in the last couple of right. years? So the first thing was that once I had a good sense of my pain point and what the solution could be technically, was to go out and get the validation on the technology and the problem statement. Uh, so I went to Stanford across the street and met with the chief technology officer and a bunch of smart people over there, uh, told them about the problem, told them about the solution. And uh, they said that, yeah, this uh, sounds very compelling. And there is nothing like this outside because if somebody's already built it, then I don't want to do it. Um, I don't want to reinvent the wheel. Uh, so as soon as I got that validation, the next thing was like calling on some of the smartest people that I know from the past 20 years, uh, who could be the part of the, the core team. Um, so, so building the team was, was critical. Sure. Um, and then, um, you know, there were a bunch of people whom I go to as mentors, like Mitch Kapoor, who is the founder of Lotus Corporation in the Valley. And I went for his advice and, uh, in Silicon Valley, there is this interesting network where you know, they say that if you, if you want uh, advice, um, if you want advice, ask for money. And if you want money, ask for advice. Okay. So you, <laughs> I have to learn that. You know. <laughs> so, if you, so when you go to ask for advice, uh, I ended up getting even money, which is interesting. So, you know, people, uh, and that's how you get your, generally your first round of funding, which is a bunch of uh, angel investors who really like about uh, the space that you are in, or uh, what the problem you're trying to solve, and uh, they believe in you as an individual. Um, And so, you know, with with that uh, initial investors, with an initial team, uh, with with an initial idea and a problem statement, I think those are like the underpinnings of the the four core things that has to come together 
to, to get a start, sure. right? Sure, and, and now you're, you're expanding globally. I mean, your partnership here with Leronomix and, yeah. and, and others. You, what's the thinking behind that to get as many, what's, what's behind that global, sure. big global push? Well, uh, you know, our core um, mission statement is that we want, uh, you know, the, the, we want to enable individuals and organizations around the world uh, to stay on the top of their game uh, with knowledge and learning. So, you know, our mission is to help everybody in the world. So, uh, and, and, and the good thing about, you know, being digital first is that it is, uh, it is global uh, from the day one. Yep. And uh, the individuals that we are serving, they are all part of global organizations. So even when we got our very first customer in the United States, uh, you know, a large uh, Fortune 500 company, uh, they were already operating in over 120 countries. So we already had users sure, worldwide. Mm. Uh, so now, you know, we are seeing uh, tremendous growth and inbound uh, tremendous interest from not just companies worldwide, but also countries. Uh, so I was in India last week uh, working with NASCOM, uh, who has already launched with Adcast uh, six, seven months back. The Prime Minister of India launched sure. Adcast uh, with NASCOM. Uh, we call it Future Skills. And it's been very successful and growing, and uh, we're getting a tremendous similar interest from many countries uh, who wants to upskill the entire nation and entire workforce, uh, which is becoming imperative in this fourth industrial revolution, because if countries don't uh, upskill their workforce, uh, they're not going to be competitive. Okay. And, and you know, if you look back in this last uh, couple of years in your journey at CAS, right, yeah. and some of the lessons you learned previously in previous organizations, what are some lessons or mistakes you made earlier on that you're avoiding here? Or what do you think are some of the mistakes you're making still and learning from? Sure. If you're willing to share some of those. Yeah, well, I think the, the number one mistake uh, that I do or I think most entrepreneurs do is the hiring mistakes, right? And I've done a ton of hiring mistakes in my past 20 years. Uh, we continue we do, to keep doing and, and, you know, we all pay the price for it. So, you know, we are, if we don't set very high standards uh, in hiring the people, you know, with the right kind of talent and attitude and, and, and values and all of that, uh, that can cost uh, significantly to the company and, and to your growth. Mm. Uh, I would say that's, that's probably number one. Uh, number two is that is always uh, in, a, in a technology business uh, where we have to build the product and the features. Uh, our biggest, uh, fe biggest friction point is, you know, breadth versus depth. So what happens is that as we expand and grow, the market always sometimes wants us to go more broader and we want to go more deeper. And that's where the friction comes in sure. and we have to find the trade-off and the right balance between the two. Uh, so that's probably, you know, uh, the second big thing. Uh, and that leads to basically overall, I think the biggest enemy for all of us uh, is focus, right? Because success uh, comes from focus. Uh, and mm -hmm. when you try to do many things, uh, you're not doing any one thing really, really well. Right. And so I think that's the, probably a, the third lesson thing. learned. Um, to keep all those three things in perspective on a daily basis and see how we not repeat those mistakes. Sure, very good. We'll take another break. We'll be right here for our third and final segment here on the Leader Anomics Show. Welcome back to the Leader Anomics Show. I'm speaking to Carl Mehta from Edcas, and every guest on our show is subject to the Thinkonomic Challenge where we give you some quick uh, questions and you have to answer them as fast as you can. So I'll start a little timer here and shoot as fast as you can and we'll see how many we can get through. You go through more than five, I think we'll, we'll give you a set for free, right? Okay. So you get a little gift. All right, and go. Would relationships be better without technology? Some relationships. Yeah. Not all. Yeah. Okay, so technology helps some. Yeah. Uh, joy can be found with simple awareness. What is your joy? Mindfulness. Mm -hmm. and, and you practice that daily? Every day. Every yeah. day. What is wrong with the world today? How should we fix this? That's not an easy question. I think we are getting all very more selfish as opposed to being more compassionate. So how, do, how do you fix that? Well, you bring more compassion in the world through the awareness, self-awareness and mindfulness practices. Okay, and, and you're doing that, huh? Yeah. Cast. How... Have you done anything lately that is worth remembering? Think, expressing thankfulness and gratitude to more people. 
And that is worth remembering, huh? Yes. Absolutely. Now, if you had a chance to empower a certain community, which one would it be? I'm always very uh, passionate about the bottom of the pyramid. So the two and a half, three billion people still live under a dollar a day. That's, uh, that's, that's a community, a community to go after. And, and we just have time for the last one. Do internet searches, uh, search engines like Google and Yahoo truly empower people? Well, yes and no. I mean, if you know what you want to do, then partially yes, but if you don't know, then it really doesn't help. So you need then the Netflix of learning uh, to bring you absolutely. what you need. <laughs> so, so, you know, so you passed the Tinkerdomic Challenge, congratulations, and we'll give you a set uh, right after the show. Right. Um, you know, speaking about EdCast again, right, um, how does it truly empower HR folks? I mean, yeah. talk us through the principles behind why EdCast is so powerful. Sure. Well, so, you know, as an organization, the, the foundation of any great high-performing organization is the culture that you build. And HR leaders, I think they're uh, one of the big priorities is sure. to ensure that they're building a great culture. And what we do with EdCast is to enable this um, HR and L&D organizations to create a culture of curiosity which is the fundamental now, especially in the yep. fourth industrial revolution. Because if your people are not having, uh, if they don't have curiosity, uh, they're not going to continue to learn. And if they're not continuously learning, uh, then they're going to be obsoleted very, very fast. Sure. And, and then the, cha the, the chances of your organization getting disrupted just exponentially increases. So the bedrock of everything is a culture of curiosity. And so we work with great HR leaders and L&D leaders to, to, to help them, uh, enable them uh, to create that culture with EdCast because what EdCast does is through that personalized access to the right content at the right time from the right people, creates that kind of curiosity. Right. In, instill some sparks of curiosity. curiosity yeah. And, so and then the, it starts with curiosity, but then it starts building on, creating a culture of continuous learning, becoming a lifelong learner, and then over the time of the journey, most important thing is to continuously upskill yourself so that whatever you want to become, let's say I want to become a data scientist or I want to become a good people manager, I can become that as I keep doing that uh, continuous form of uh, you know, micro and macro learning journeys. Sure, sure. Now, now, you know, if you were to advise a group of CEOs, say you know, speaking at a conference with 500 CEOs, and you were to give one nugget of wisdom, you know, just one big advice that has helped you in your own life and your own journey, what sort of advice would you impart to these business leaders? I think the, the key thing is having a very compelling mission uh, because CEOs have to set the, the vision and a very compelling mission uh, because that's what people are coming to work to for you or for your company. And if you don't have a very inspiring vision, if you don't have a very compelling mission, and you as a CEO has to do a, a great job at continuously communicating that and not just communicating but also walk the talk because uh, you know people don't just listen or hear they also see how <clears throat> you know the 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 leadership yeah. is walking the talk on the vision and on the vision and the mission and if you take care of that then i think the rest of the things is just details that will take care of itself sure sure and and you know if you go down a level to the hr leaders you know you talk about culture as being one big component right you know what sort of advice you you know in light of this wuka world in light of all the changes that are happening right what sort of what's important for hr to think about well hr is great at hr and that's why they are in that those great roles is that hr uh, uh, professionals will have to become very good at technology too so uh, until now, they relied on some other IT department or some other tech person. But, uh, and it's not just for HR. I think it's everybody who is in non-tech role will have to become savvy at technology and will have to become really good at technology because you know, everything in the world is becoming uh, technology enabled. And every business is becoming a technology business first. So HR folks, as they become more and more technology uh, driven, uh, they'll be very successful. Okay. And, and my final question as we close out the show, you know, it's, you know, a lot of young people are looking and watching this interview and say, I want to be like Carl. I want to start businesses. I want to be successful. I want to become, you know, this leader that you've morphed into, right? So if you were to advise these young folks who are starting out in life, maybe just finishing university or, or, or coming out into the working world, right? Uh, what sort of, you know, advice would you give to these young people, you know, in yeah. terms of staying the course, in terms of being able to become like you, you know, at some point in time? 
Well, um, if you're starting out in your career from college, I would say that uh, the most important, the best place that you can learn would be to go work at a real startup because that's where you're going to get a 360 degrees view of, you know, you'll see how the founder and a very small team is going through every single challenge. And uh, that's the best place to learn. If you don't, don't chase prestigious jobs at big brand name companies, uh, I have nothing against them. They're, they're all great companies and they're my customers too. <laughs> but, you know, as you're starting out, you're going to be one of the doing some one little job in a pretty big machinery. So you'll never understand the full machinery that goes into taking an idea to a full execution. Right. So spending two, three, four years, five years uh, at a startup, uh, just being there, feeling the energy, learning, seeing, and you will be thrown multiple jobs you'll not be confined to one specific thing then you'll have to wear multiple hats every day i think that will build you up into a very very solid person that someday in life if you feel like venturing out and building your own company you would have all the necessary grounding that's better than doing any mba uh, a three to five year at a real startup is better than an mba very good carl thank you so much for your time we've been absolute pleasure speaking to you here mm -hmm. speaking to carl meta from adcast here on the linomic show